morning, Celebration Worship. This is Pastor Silverio coming to you from our Pearland campus. I am so thankful that you're joining us today. And I know that God has something very special planned for all of us. I know that God is big enough to give us all the encouragement, all the strength, everything that we need to face this brand new week together. God is able to do that for us. And so as we worship, know that that God is here and present in our living rooms, wherever it is that we are uh, gathering together today, God is with us. So let's worship with confidence. Let's worship with joy. Let's really rejoice that God has given us this brand new day to enjoy his presence, all right? As you get settled in, let me tell you about a couple of things. One is that if you haven't already had a chance to check out our new Psalm prayer room nights on Thursdays at 815, it's not too late to join us. This has truly become a week in which we are encouraging one another we're praying for one another. We're learning about prayer. And our simple prayer uh, for this season and for this uh, for this gathering is this, that God would take this very difficult season in our lives and make it be for us one in which we can truly say that we drew closer to God in the midst of it. So uh, if that's your prayer, if you want to join us, come on out, newsongparaland.org slash pray. That's where you need to go, newsongparaland.org slash pray. You'll see the link there. Uh, just go and leave your email. Everything that you need to know is right there, and we'll be able to we'll be able to get you get you plugged in, get you logged on. Everything that you need uh, this Thursday. I look forward to I look forward to seeing you there. Also, if you're new to this community, if you've been watching online for for some time now, uh, and you want to know more about First Methodist Paraland, if you want to know more about a celebration worship. You want to know more about new song worship that uh, a brand new community that we're going to be starting out of this very worship service in the fall um, i want to tell you that there's going to be an opportunity for you to do that next sunday at 9 30 on zoom so uh pastor thea and myself are going to be hanging out there and we want to invite you to come on out or actually you stay at your house all you have to do is log on to zoom we'll send you the link exactly where you need to be um, and we want to get to know you, meet you, uh, know who you are, tell us about ourselves as well, and tell you how you can get connected to First Methodist Paraland in this season. So all you have to do to join us is text the word WELCOME to 281-603-1226. That's 281-603-1226. So I hope you'll take us up on that. I look forward to the opportunity to meet you. All right, so uh, that's all. That's all I have. So now uh, let's get ready to worship. And remember... God is here. God is big enough. God hears us. Um, and God is is, uh, is available to us as we give him all of our praise, all of our worship, because he is worthy of it today. Amen. God bless you.
you shall remain. I will rejoice, I will declare, God is my victory. Father God, we thank you for an opportunity to join together, and we thank you that even in the valley and even through the trials, we can remember and recognize that we have the victory in your name and that you're already working through this, you're working this out. I know that if any of us stop for a moment just to think about it, we can see miracles happening all around us. Thank you for that and for who you are. I pray that you challenge us and change us through your word this morning. It's in your name we pray, amen. So God blesses us so that we can bless other people. But through this, some of us may not feel very blessed. <laughs> and we feel like we, we just need to like, connect to what God wants for our lives. And there's a lot of ways that we can do that through this season. We could be the hands and feet of God, but we can also reach out for people who are being the hands and feet of God. So you can give online as usual, but we also have our COVID-19 fund. You can give to that, or you can email the email address that's on your screen, if you are struggling and you need some assistance, and our church can help you in that way. So for everybody who's new or just people who have been around for a while and want to get to know the staff and the team a little bit better and get to know the vision of this church and this campus, Pastor Thea and Pastor Silverio are having a welcome party on May 31st, and that's going to be at 9.30 a.m., and it's going to be through Zoom, and a lot of us are used to using that kind of format at this point. So go ahead and text the number that's on your screen if you want to take part in that. May God bless you as you give this morning. Let's pray. God, we thank you for everything that you've given us. We thank you for your word, and we thank you that you are here with us through this. I want to pray that any of us who are just struggling to see you or struggling to, to get away from the distractions, that we will find our center in you, we'll find our hope in you, and that your Holy Spirit will speak to us. Amen. Let's sing.
Good morning, and thank you for joining us for this online worship. I'm Pastor Thea, and I'm really excited to be a part of this worship service this week. This worship service is actually one of my favorite services to catch online each week because of the authenticity and the wonderful music, and I'm really excited to be a part of it today. As we venture into what might be the new normal after this COVID reality, I am a little excited and a lot of nervous. I'm really looking forward to seeing people again, you people, the people that I'm called and honored to serve and walk alongside. 
And I'm even a little excited about seeing strangers at the restaurant again one day when that seems safe. And I'm really nervous about what this really means. I'm nervous about making sure I take all the precautions necessary to keep myself safe and my family, and especially those around me who are more vulnerable to this disease. And I'm anxious about what the future really might look like as our community and, and state and nation look into living into this post-COVID reality. And amidst all that worry and confusion and uncertainty, I also know that Jesus changes everything that God is bigger than all of this and working for good in all things. And I hope that some of the messaging that you've been receiving in this series, Jesus Changes Everything, where we've talked about how COVID-19 has exposed some of our vulnerabilities, our tendency to idolize other gods, our tendency to hold grudges against those who have hurt us, and even our tendency to think that it's all about us and that we have to control everything. I hope that you've seen how God actually is full of grace even in this time and that God does have everything under control, even this pandemic that we're still learning so much about. And I'm looking forward today to kind of drive that message home with our final message in this Jesus Changes Everything and talk about how Jesus is changing you in this time as well, and how Jesus will continue doing that work as we venture into whatever the future might hold. But before we begin, I'm going to invite you to pray with me. Gracious and good, good God, you are Lord, and we are not. Thank you, God, for being with us in this time for being with us in our doubt and our worry and our fears and our anxiety. Thank you for leading us and calling us your own, even when we are so unsure about what the future might hold. And Lord, at this time, I pray your presence would be fully felt, that we would be able to connect to you in a real and meaningful way, and that you would speak to us with something new, drawing us closer to you. Lord, above all, I pray that we would be courageous enough to follow you and love others the way that you love. You are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So when we first started this Jesus Changes Everything series, the first scripture that popped in my head was when Jesus actually changed water into wine. I don't know if you're familiar with this, but this is in John chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. And before this, this uh, scripture really didn't seem too significant for me, and maybe it hasn't for you as well. But I hope today we can learn some new things about this actually really important act that Jesus does. Let's read together in John 2, verses 1 through 11. On the third day, a wedding took place at Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there. And Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, They have no more wine. Woman, why do you involve me? Jesus replied, My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. So they filled them to the brim. Then he told them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. They did so, and the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine. He did not realize where it had come from, though the servant who had drawn the water knew. Then he called the bridegroom aside and said, everyone brings out the choice wine first, and then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink. But you have saved the best till now. What Jesus did here in Cana of Galilee was the first of the signs through which he revealed his glory, and his disciples believed in him. So right off with this scripture, I used to really wonder, what is the point 
I mean, why, why water to wine? Why is Jesus even worried about this wedding and these guests? I mean, I would read it and think, this is a real waste of Jesus's power, right? Well, when I looked into the historical situation and this historic and the culture of the Jewish people, I realized that weddings are actually a really big deal. And not the same way that they are for us, where it's about a really fancy dress or two or three that sometimes brides have, or even a really delicious cake. But Jewish weddings were days long of festival and celebrations, and they were all centered on celebrating new life, the newness and um, what it was to come with God's blessing of this union. And actually, wine is also very significant to the Jewish people. It too represents new creation, new life ahead. And so where it seems like Jesus was a little too occupied with something simple, instead he actually takes this simple thing of wine at a wedding and makes it very significant. And I wonder if Jesus has done the same thing with you. Have you ever stepped outside and just felt the sun on your face in a way that made you sit back in awe of God's creation? The beauty and the intricacy of all of these living things somehow coexisting together pretty well. Or maybe back when you used to take a commute to work, when you gained those extra few minutes, maybe you got a green light or there just wasn't as much traffic. And in those extra minutes that you weren't expecting, you had a moment to breathe, to prepare for your day and seemingly get ready for what was ahead. In this time of COVID-19, I've been checking in on our families. How are you doing? How are the kids? Are you guys staying safe? Are you staying sane? And for the most part, you are, which I'm glad to hear. Many of you um, are, have higher appreciation for your kids' teachers and are really over kindergarten Zoom classes, for sure. But I talked to a dad a couple of weeks ago who shared that um, in this time, he had a realization. He was watching his boys play together, and play together well. And he shared that over a coffee with his wife, he said, you know what, whenever this is all over, I don't want to go back to the way it was. I don't want to be so busy that we rarely have an evening at home, much less this extended time together to enjoy one another, to play games and talk and laugh. Recently, I checked in with him and he said that he's actually decided that these kids are going to have to make a choice of just one activity to kind of re-engage uh, in once this uh, reality uh, allows that. And he realizes that his kids are going to maybe be a little nervous about that and not, and not be too excited. And he saw that even that small choice that he's offering is also teaching his young boys about decisions and priorities and work-life balance, even when they're just nine and 12 years old. That's the thing about Jesus. Jesus cares about the seemingly simple and has this ability to change them into significant things that can change our perspective and what we really value. Another important thing about this scripture and what Jesus does with changing the water into wine is actually what the water was originally intended for. So we read, nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used by Jews for ceremonial washing, each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. So what's important here is to notice what ceremonial washing is and the rituals that the Jewish community had. So on one hand, there is no running water and there is very little medicine in this time. And the Jews lived in very communal uh, living areas, so people really close together. And they had this belief that whether you were spiritually or physically unclean, it was really important to get clean before you were with the rest of the, of the community. As if, you know, your spiritual or physical uncleanliness would contaminate those around you. So they had a lot of rituals to stay clean so as to keep the others safe. Kind of sounds a little familiar <laughs> to what we're experiencing today, doesn't it? So at this wedding, this, this amount of water would have not just been easily available and around ready to be used for whatever someone wanted. More than likely, this amount of water available at this wedding would have been for a ritual cleansing of some sort. 
maybe for the guests, maybe for the bride and groom as they enter this new life together. But when, what Jesus does when he changes this ceremonial water into wine is that he shifts the focus from rituals to relationships. These weddings, again, would last days, and they're among family and friends. And Jesus is saying, while yes, being clean is very important, but let's not miss this opportunity for the party to continue and for us to continue in laughter and discussion, dancing and having fun together at this wedding, shifting that focus again from rituals to relationships. In our world today, in this COVID reality, we have gained a lot of new rituals for cleanliness, and they're important and they're good. Most of us are wearing masks when we go out in public, especially around large, large crowds that we can't distance ourselves in. Um, we are washing our hands more and wiping down our products as we bring them into the home. We're trying to practice this safe distancing and giving people a lot more space between us and being a little bit more cautious about where we go when we're feeling not too great. And while these rituals are important, they are designed to keep us safe and to keep others safe, I want to encourage us not to forget about relationships in this time. There are people behind those masks, and they really matter. So what are the ways that we can focus on relationships right now? Well, first off, call a friend. Text someone that you know needs to be reached out to. Set up a Zoom call so you can see each other's face. Laugh together, touch base, talk about what's really going on. Maybe if you're feeling safe, you and a neighbor who's also feeling safe could meet up for a safe distancing walk in your neighborhood. You have space between you, you're outside, and your faces are not even pointed at each other as you walk and talk. And if you're really feeling safe, maybe you could invite over another family who's been quarantined, who is also ready to venture out. You guys can sit in your backyard, put some space between you, but take the opportunity to talk about this reality together. Pour into those relationships that really matter while being safe and practical. And more than anything, I hope and I pray that you're taking this time to pour into those relationships in your home, with your children, and with your spouse. Talk about what's really going on, how you're really feeling, your real fears and concerns, your doubts and your worries. Discuss together the, the ways that you have seen God in all of this and even the times that you've wondered, where is God in all of this mess? As we increase our rituals and staying clean and safe and keeping one another healthy, we also have to stay focused on relationships because those two are important. Finally, one thing I wanted to talk about in um, this scripture about the wedding and how Jesus is changing things is we see how um, Jesus also changes expectations into exceptions. So first off, we see this when Jesus changes the water into wine and it gets served to the host. And the host is like, what? What? This late in the wedding, I'm expecting the worst kind of, you know, low-grade wine to be served, but you have saved the best for last. And of course, Jesus' wine is going to be the best one that they've ever tasted, right? But more so, there's another line that said where how Jesus responds to his mother, who kind of um, not, not even directly suggests that he gets involved in this lack of wine thing. We read, uh, Jesus responds to that request with, woman, why do you involve me? My hour has not yet come. And I think us modern readers, unfortunately, tend to read that line as if he's speaking down to his mother, as if uh, God incarnate would be disrespectful to his own mom. We read that as if Jesus is like, woman, why are you coming at me with this? I am trying to get my chicken dance on at this wedding right now. I ain't got time to be worried about it, right? Well, I looked at where Jesus also uses this phrase other times in the Gospel of John, and he actually does it often, where he begins a sentence with woman and then directs with kindness and clarity of what is still ahead. Some of the places we see that is with the woman at the well. He says, woman, know that you will no longer have to worship on this mountain or in a temple, suggesting that there is a greater type of worship to come in the near future. We also see this when the woman is brought to Jesus to be stoned, caught in the act of adultery. 
when her accusers have left, seeing that they too are full of sin, he says, woman, where are they? Have you no accusers? And Jesus says it again on the cross, again to his mother, when he says, woman, here is your son, giving her to John to take care of in his absence. And so here, when Jesus says it again, to his, says it first to his mother, he is being kind and compassionate and reassuring that there is something yet more to come. And actually, he says those words, my hour has not yet come. And this not yet also appears often in the Gospel of John from Jesus' mouth, saying things that about his hour not yet fully here. Later in the gospel, Jesus outlines exactly what is going to come, this full glory that God has planned that will be fully revealed and fully manifested in the life and death of Jesus. And just after Jesus outlines that completely to his disciples, he begins to pray, and he says these words, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son that your son may glorify you. For you granted him authority over all people, that he might give eternal life to all those you have given him. Now, this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. And what happens immediately next is Jesus is arrested, and he's tried and found guilty for merely being who he really is. And next, he is beaten and crucified, where he dies a horrible, gruesome, public, yet awful and alone death. And the people who put him to death were sure that was it, that all of these Jesus shenanigans would be over, that his followers would dissipate, and they would go back to leading, trying to strive for their own righteousness by following the laws put on them. But it wasn't the end. Just three days later, Jesus comes out of that grave, changing that expectation to an exception that none of us could have ever imagined. One that says that death is not the end and that there is an eternal glory for all of us to enjoy both now and forever. And that eternal glory comes through this Jesus sent to change everything for everyone. Friends, this is a reality that we get to know today and we get to live into for every day yet to come, no matter what that might hold. I wonder how we, the, those who live with this truth, who know this truth to be the center of our lives, how we might live that out how we might be exceptions to the expectations even in this time. I think about the disciple Thomas, who unfortunately missed the day that Jesus showed back up to the disciples after the resurrection. And when Jesus catches back up with those disciples and they tell him, we have seen the risen Lord, Thomas is like, nah, bro, I don't believe you. No way. There's not enough evidence here. I'm going to have to see it for myself. And maybe Thomas should have believed his friends. Maybe he should have taken their word as the real truth. But what we see instead is that he says, your life, your life isn't telling me that there's a risen Lord. You are still hiding away in the upper room behind locked doors. Nah, I'm going to have to see it for myself. And I know many people who have less problems with Jesus and instead have problems with how we, those who say we believe in Jesus, live our lives. They look at our lives and say, nah, I don't believe it. I'm going to have to see it for myself. And so friends, in this time, I pray that we would continue to live like this is true, to let it completely change the lives that we are bound I am not saying that we do not need to be cautious. We as Christians need to lead the way with care and caution for the people around us, for our own families and for those most vulnerable to this disease. And friends, we also are called to lead a life that literally says out loud every day with full authority that in fact Jesus changes everything. Let's pray. Gracious. And good 
Good God, we are so thankful to know this truth in our hearts, to have the opportunity to live it out loud in ways that we have not yet even imagined. Lord, as we venture into whatever lies ahead, into a new reality that we still don't understand, may we do so with the true honesty and the true living proof that you change everything, that you change our situations at home, you change our situations at work, you change our faith communities, you change our neighborhoods, and Lord, you change the world with who you are. Let no one doubt who you are through the lives that we lead, Lord, that we would be brave and courageous to follow you and to truly live with this truth that you change everything. Amen. You were the word at the beginning, one with God the Lord most high. You're hidden 